Okay, well, um, I'm going to show you today some evidence of shamanism from Alaska. I've got quite a lot to show you here, so um, buckle up. The um, Eskimo Inuit world stretches from Prince William Sound all the way to eastern Greenland. It's one of the largest, well, probably the largest indigenous territory in the world. And it's the last region of the New World to be settled by humans about 5,000 years ago. People east of Alaska generally prefer to be called Inuit. People in western Alaska still refer to themselves as Eskimo, although more often you'll hear people uh, call themselves Inupiat or, or Yupik. This is the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta in Alaska. This forms the heart of the central Yupik culture area. And the YK Delta is roughly the size of Britain. But despite that, uh, Yupik prehistory is almost entirely unknown. Before our project, the last best and best reported excavation of a pre-contact Yupik site was a single one by eight meter trench back in 1976. There are about 25,000 people living here, 18,000 of whom still speak Yupik. There are 56 villages like this one scattered across the region. And the Yupik are the largest population of Native Americans in Alaska and one of the largest groups of Native Americans left in the U.S. Southwest Alaska was the most heavily populated part of the entire Eskimo Inuit world. Resources were abundant enough to support more sedentary settlement than elsewhere in the Arctic. The prehistoric uh, population of Baffin or Ellesmere might have been around 500 whereas in southwest Alaska you can have a single village with that many people. The Russian fur trade operated in south Alaska since the mid 1700s but outside contact came fairly late not until about the 1820s when the first Russian fur hunters pushed up at the Yupik area. Introduced diseases swept through the region wiping out entire villages. By 1838 at least 60% of the Yupik population was dead regional diversity and social distinctions within Yupik society collapsed. In 1900, a flu epidemic cut the remaining Yupik population in half in just three months. Yupik celebrated important events in the seasonal subsistence calendar with mask dances, symbolizing the recycling of animal spirits and seeking to balance the animal spirit and human worlds. Russian Orthodox priests began working in Yupik communities by the 1850s and shamanism was discouraged, although Yupik ceremonialism was generally tolerated until the 1880s when larger numbers of Protestant and Catholic missionaries arrived. So mask dancing was the most visible aspect of the Yupik belief system and was actively suppressed until Yupik dancing was revived beginning in the late 18, 1980s. We're working um, near the village of Quinnahawk, which lies near the southern boundary of the Yupik homeland. The nearest other village is about 50 kilometers away. Wild foods are still crucial to economic survival in rural Alaska where groceries have to be flown in and food's extremely expensive. But it goes beyond that. Subsisting on wild foods structures the yearly <coughs> cycle of life and the ways people see themselves and their world. Although nominally Christian, much of the traditional worldview that sustains a subsistence way of life remains intact. Although people don't live in sod houses anymore, the Yupik use of space around the house is both traditional and intact. Yupik living space is designed to accommodate all the tools, gear, and processing areas needed to live off the land. The Nunalik Project is a partnership between the Connect Dot Corporation, the Village Corporation of Quinnahawk, and the University of Aberdeen. The corporation supplies the logistics, vehicles, boats, lab space, and, and so on and Aberdeen supplies the uh, technical expertise in archaeology. This is the Nunalik site. If you look closely, you'll see a tower on the horizon and, and a village uh, just to the right of it. Quinnahuk <coughs> is about four miles from the site. The site's being rapidly destroyed by marine erosion. That's um, now that the permafrost is melted. This is a problem across the Arctic. Par parts of Alaska have lost more than a mile of shoreline and with it the whole archaeological record. So since we started working in 2009 that uh, shoreline has retreated about 10 meters so we're working against time and it's, we could still lose all this in a single st uh, storm. The real heart of the project comes from a very high level of local engagement. 
you know, both in the field and in the lab. And the people of Quinnahawk aren't the subjects of our research, they are our colleagues, and we're working, and we work together to figure out the past. Consultation with elders and culture bearers is crucial to interpreting our finds at the site, and we combine traditional and scientific ways of knowing. We've uncovered a sod house complete with multiple side rooms connected by a long covered hallway. Last year, a magnetometer survey showed that it extended at least another 16 meters to the east. According to oral history, this house form was a means of defending against attack from other villages, and the house was eventually burned and the occupants uh, killed. Because the site has been encased in uh, permafrost until just the last few years, the preservation is spectacular. It's all grass and wood chips. We get more organic stuff than we do soil, actually. And more than 80% of the artifacts we find are rarely preserved materials, and this is uh, some of the grass, the leather, bits of uh, leather clothing, and here are some of the wooden artifacts, hunting gear with the original paint and so on, on it. And so we get an unusually clear look at Yupik material culture, and Yupik belief systems, which are rooted in shamanism, are reflected both directly and indirectly in many finds from the site. Sea mammal hunting required a lot of complex technologies, and each piece was made with special care to be aesthetically pleasing and precise as possible. This is a way of showing respect to the spirits of sea mammals. And a uh, sea mammal would choose to give itself to a hunter who had finally made hunting gear. Yupik life is structured around respect relationships between people, animals, objects, and the spirit world. Amulets symbolize and help maintain these respect relationships, and shamans would make ivory am amulets like these for both adults and children to wear around their necks. Some of these pieces might represent souvenirs from the hunt uh, made from the, the teeth of the animals killed uh, and some Quinnahawk residents still keep and carve um, mementos of the hunts like this today. These are earrings from the site and they have a hook in back that goes through a hole in your ear. And they're made of um, uh, walrus and mammoth ivory You'll see that a lot of them are, are carved with concentric rings, and those, um, the centers are inset with removable wooden plugs. So for years, the archaeologists have called this the circle and dot motif, but according to the Yupik, it's much more than that. It's in fact a model of the layered universe of Yupik cosmology. There are five layers in the universe with Shlam Yua, the person of the universe at the center. This design is also called the eye of awareness and the wooden plugs in the earrings could be removed to open that eye. The earring on the right may well represent the person of the universe with a literal eye of awareness on one side. The drilled holes originally held bright pieces of pyrite that would have sparkled in the sun. Yupik belief systems and the role of the shaman are predicated on maintaining the harmony and balance between these bounded layers of the universe while allowing passage between them. And this eye of awareness is um, frequent on a lot of pieces of the artwork uh, from the site, all uh, oftentimes with that removable wooden plug. Birds traveled in both the land and the sea, and as anthropologist Anne Fennep Ridden pointed out, were especially valued by the Yupik for their ability to cross boundaries. Many of these may be amulets uh, made by the uh, shamans. For the Yupik, animals were part of their social world, and many other animals are also represented in these wooden figurines. Sea mammals like beluga and seal predominate, but we also find small fish, caribou, land mammals, and even a porcupine, a little porcupine <coughs> on top with little spines. And uh, the Yupik maintain careful distinctions between land and sea mammals to uh, ensure successful passages between worlds. And these amulets were stored in little wooden boxes like these and some of them are shaped like animals, and we find the little charm boxes that were um, originally tied to a sled or a kayak deck. These are just a few examples. Owls are associated with spiritual and shamanic power. It's said that owls could speak Yupik and tell the future. So at Nanalik, um, the owls are represented by ivory amulets and uh, figurines as well as masks. At the heart of the Yupik belief system, is the idea of an ensouled world where the souls of humans, animals, and objects are continually recycled. 
The souls, or yua, are represented as beings that dwell within all things and that sometimes peek out of eyes and mouths and even the fur of animals, like in these ethnographic uh, masks to the left. And thus, the yua is really the thinking part of any creature or object. And simply put, according to Yupik belief systems, many of the objects we find are alive. And oftentimes we'll find these little faces of the yua peeking out from different objects, whether it's a spoon or a yad arrow shaft, even you know mask attachments, an uh, ulu handle, uh, and so on. The small sticks here uh, have dozens of faces, as if multiple souls are trapped inside. They're really reminiscent of the Dorset shaman's wands that are made of uh, antler from the eastern Arctic that uh, date back to uh, two and three thousand years. We find hundreds of very simply carved dolls. This is about half the collection here of <laughs> these. Uh, most of them are made of broken pieces of kayak ribs. They're one of the few artifact classes that we don't find represented in ethnographic collections. <coughs> some, of the, um, some of these have faces on both sides, often a smiling face on one side, a frowning face on the other. Some have multiple faces, again, suggesting multiple yua inside. We also have several hundred more elaborate human figurines from the site. Some of these were used as protective amulets. Dolls were also used as shaman's helpers. Other dolls were simply playthings for children, and still others were portraits of individuals that could be used to take their place at important events like meetings. You know, instead of going to a meeting, you just send your doll. Yeah. Well, great thing. So most dolls are simple stake-shaped bodies and uh, were originally provided with um, skin cl uh, for clothing, like this small doll with uh, dog fur. So ones like on the left, those two on the left are probably more of a, um, a shamanic kind of a doll with the kind of spirit faces. And these may be portraits, and we think this is more of a, um, a play doll. Some doll faces are generic, but others have a lot of personality, and the Yupik sense of humor comes across in a lot of these carvings. The doll with librettes, and, and librettes are kind of a, a, a lip plug, like a piercing, that shows a social status. Those may be portraits of individuals within the village, and even today, people sometimes see themselves in these dolls. We also find uh, faces representing the yua on, some, on the front of some of the dolls, which may indicate a ceremonial function. The doll on the far right has got a space where its soul has been removed, um, perhaps as part of a uh, shamanic ritual. These two figurines were found nearby one another and may represent a matched pair. One depicts a human or spirit woman transforming into a wolf. The other is a two-faced doll with a yua depicted on its chest. You can see the, the eyes and the mouth there. And, and on the other side, a hollow throat. These may be tools of a shaman. The wolf transformation imagery appears in artifacts from the house that was burned during the bow and arrow wars. According to local oral history, the Nunalik people called themselves people of the wolf at the time. In the earlier houses, we get a lot more imagery of seals rather than wolves. The Yupik have a lot of stories about little people, supernatural beings that appear occasionally and can travel through time. Little people with pointed heads in particular act as uh, shaman's helpers. And Yupik speakers on Kodiak Island south of the YK Delta call it Kalak, which is very similar to what they're called in Siberia. This suggests, of course, a very ancient uh, shamanistic belief system. Masks at Nunalik come in miniature as well as first uh, full-size versions. This past summer, Yupik mask carver Drew Michael joined us and found this small mask. Drew and the other uh, mask, Yupik mask carvers are working with us to better understand mask making at the site. Wooden masks were used throughout the Arctic, but they were especially important in Alaska. It was once thought that Yupik mask making began only after the historic period as part of inner village ceremonialism that arose at the end of the Bow and Arrow Wars. But the evidence from Nunalik clearly shows that the mask making tradition was thriving centuries before contact. These are all small masks. These are about, <coughs> these are about hand sized, but they are all carved with eye and attachment holes just like full sized masks. Russian accounts tell of masks worn by large dolls in Yupik households. And those large dolls protected the household, and offerings were made, and these big large dolls could tell the future. 
This large wooden head was found next to a house post, which it may originally have been tied to. Mask makers tell us that those down, uh, downturn stripes mean that um, an ability to see below the ground or below the water, but upturned lines like this are a sign of an ability to see into the heavens. Many of our smaller masks were made on this scale and seemed to fit this wooden head. We also find lots of uh, drum rim fragments along with drum handles and it's really clear that Yupik ceremonialism was uh, being very actively practiced on the site. In historic times, most masks were destroyed or left out in the tundra immediately after a dance performance. This is called putting away the mask. And nearly all of the full-size masks we found in the upper levels of Nunalik were found broken, usually in half. The smaller hand-sized masks are often also found broken in a similar way, suggesting that these were also part of Yupik ceremony and not just models or toys. The faces on some masks and dolls are asymmetrical, and that asymmetry signals that that individual is half in and half out of the spirit world or undergoing transformation. At first glance, uh, this mask looks like a slightly asymmetrical face, but when you look at it from different angles, you can actually see there's multiple faces represented there. There's just kind of a scowling face on the left and a happy face on the right, and even a third or even a fourth face, all represented in a single mask. And that reflects a Yupik preference to express multiple meanings in the same object. In the earlier levels of the site, dating to the uh, 16th century, like mid-1500s, we think. Uh, the masks aren't destroyed, but they're left around strategic places in the house, uh, in entranceways and in post molds and so on. Yupik ceremonial events were designed to maintain proper respect relationships between the human and non-human worlds. Some masks embody helping spirits, and the carver of this mask may could use as a wood grain around the eye, uh, like, the, like the eye of awareness. And it's also got uh, holes in, it, in the cheeks for librettes that represent um, a connection to the human social world. Many other masks speak to transformation and the fluid movement between human and animal worlds. And the idea of transformation is there were some beings that could transform back and forth from human into animal. And some humans had the power to appear and speak to you in either human or animal form. This mask may represent one of these extraordinary humans. The librettes here are both tusks and librettes, and part of the hair on the chin was uh, sea mammal hair, and part of it was uh, human hair. As you can see, a lot of the original paint was still preserved in this mask. It's possible this is a shaman's mask because this was a lot uh, more sturdily built than the other mask, which seemed like they were kind of quickly carved and easily destroyed. This one. Um, was really well made and it would have been very difficult to uh, just break in half. Yupik carvers are extremely skilled at depicting animals. This is just a chip of wood, but with just a few uh, strokes of a carving knife, it turns into a seal. This mask shows a seal with its nostrils pinched shut, and this helped us decode ownership marks that we'd seen on the bottom of uh, bowls. It's uh, a seal nose. And those, um, the seal um, ownership marks uh, were distributed um, in the same way as librettes or these lip plugs uh, with the seal um, motifs on them. So high status items are also unevenly distributed at the site. So what's emerging is a picture of pre-contact Yupik society, a good deal more stratified and less egalitarian than uh, was recorded in historic times and it's possible that um, shamanic and political power were linked. And yes, uh, seals really do laugh like that. <laughs> and you can see also that the mask has the Brett hole, so there's a human element there as well. Yupik masks are famous for their complexity and multiple attachments, typically tied to mask hoops, that uh, symbolize the different layers of the universe. Mask attachments are common finds at Nunalik. Um, and we see a lot of similarities um, with um, the ethnographic record that uh, and, and ethnographic collections made three and four hundred years later. There's a few more mask attachments depicting sea mammals, uh, animal appendages, 
a caribou leg and a pair of uh, walrus tusks. We also recovered Yupik dance sticks at the site and they're remarkably similar to those in ethnographic collections despite the fact that they're a good four centuries older. At least some of the larger wooden animal figurines found at the site may have been used in this context. So to conclude, it's clear from our finds in Nunalik that Yupik belief systems were anchored in, in shamanistic beliefs, including an ensouled world, a layered universe with boundaries that could be crossed by spirits and powerful individuals like a shaman, and the necessity to maintain proper respect <coughs> relationships between these spirit, natural, and human worlds. All of these things are reflected in, in the material culture of the site. It's also clear that the historically recorded ceremonial practice recorded among the Yupik extended back in time to at least the 16th century and probably a lot more. Uh, so three or four centuries before European contact. And the links between Nunalik material and earlier sites across the Arctic confirmed that shamanism was part of the cultural baggage that the ancestors of the Yupik brought with them when they settled the Arctic 5,000 years ago. And as a postscript, We'd like to add that the people in Quinhuk are publicly re-engaging with aspects of traditional belief again. In 2013, young people who participated in the dig asked permission to form a dance group, and this was their first Yupik dance in more than a century. And uh, 60,000 pieces of the Nunalit collection, um, and growing fast, is one of the largest collections ever recovered from Alaska and, and the Arctic and it's being returned to Quinhawk to the newly constructed um, New Nalek Culture Center and Archaeological Repository in opening days, May 19th, uh, 2018. Thank you. Thank you.